course, the number of foreign interventions went up after the Cold War, which tells you that the US is really an imperial power. It's an informal empire, which I go into in my book, which is different than a formal empire that the Romans and the British had, but it's an empire nonetheless. And so we have an increase in these interventions after the, after the major enemy has gone away. In fact, we've moved into the sphere of the enemy. We've uh, now incorporated many of the old Warsaw Pact countries and some uh, parts of the Soviet Union into NATO. Uh, so we're filling this void. Uh, if anything, we're going away, we're going towards more interventionism. Uh, so, but the advantage of that have, have declined because we don't really need to do it uh, because of this uh, overarching enemy. And I think the costs have increased dramatically uh, for the people here at home uh, when we get the blowback uh, like 9-11. Uh, in 1998, I did a study on, um, uh, when I was wor working at Cato, and I documented over 60 instances of where U.S. foreign policy uh, resulted in blowback terrorist attacks. I then warned of a catastrophic terrorist attack if we didn't stop this. And that was uh, three years before 9-11. Now, I didn't predict the method of attack or anything like that, but I do think it, if it's obvious to me, it's probably obvious to other people that you know, this is a very poor policy. And in fact, empire does not equal security. Uh, in fact, just the opposite. And I think uh, the costs and benefits of doing this have, have changed, and we really ought to reconsider uh, the policy. Now, of course, in response, when I give this argument, uh, and I live here in Washington, um, and when I give this argument either overseas or here in Washington, you get this, well, you get platitudes in, in response. People will say, well, the world's become more interdependent. We can't be like ostriches and stick our head in the sand and, uh, because you know we could have another Hitler pop up and we've got to be vigilant and all that. And I, and, um, I say, well, Yes, the world has become more interdependent. We have uh, increased trade, increased investment, increased financial transactions. We have increased cultural um, interactions. And of course, transportation has become much better. So we, people can get uh, everywhere uh, more easily and more cheaply. So we have more people uh, go, uh, traveling to other places. But there's one area that the interdependence hasn't increased. In fact, it's decreased. Cross-border aggression has dramatically decreased after World War II. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because there is more international law than there, were, than there was before, but the major reason is nuclear weapons. Now, that's unfortunate, but it does tend to make countries uh, more hesitant about getting into each other's business. You'll notice that we're treating North Korea much differently than we did Iraq. Um, and I asked Don Rumsfeld one time at a meeting before the war, uh, I asked him about that, and uh, uh, I got a long, rambling answer. Uh, but the real, but the real reason for that is that North Koreans have nuclear weapons. That's not a good thing, but it, it does tend to moderate cross-border aggression. So if if people are less likely to attack us here at home, then our government should be um, uh, less interventionist overseas because. Uh, we, have, we have our own uh, arsenal of nuclear we weapons, which is uh, uh, really, no one's even close to our arsenal. And plus, we, uh, we have the traditional things that George Washington mentioned, you know, we're away from the centers of conflict. Uh, we have two large moats of oceans, uh, and it's very hard to run amphibious assaults, um, as some of you are probably aware. It's a very, it's probably one of the most difficult military operations, simply because uh, even over a short uh, or a small body of water, like uh, uh, Normandy, the invasion of Normandy almost didn't work. And think about doing it across the Atlantic or Pacific Oceans. Now, you have long-range air power, but we do have um, uh, our own long-range air power, and we also have nuclear weapons, which will deter anyone from uh, attacking the United States. We also have weak and friendly neighbors of Mexico and uh, Canada. So we have a very advantageous security position here. Uh, and we ought to take advantage of it, I think. And uh, so, and, and with the drop in cross-border aggression, uh, I think the world has become less interdependent in that sense, and that's, that's a positive development. Now, I think within that, we need to reduce our nuclear arsenal and, and get other countries to do so. But, but certainly, um, we, have to, we should be taking these factors into account and saying, is, our, is this intervention of foreign policy 
it, we just rely on platitudes, and that's what you hear in Washington. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to be a leader. We have to um, get involved in the world. We can't be isolationists. And of course, somebody mentioned yesterday that isolation is, isolationists, uh, the use of that term is a, is a one-word killer for anybody who's arguing for military restraint. Uh, and it was developed as that by um, um, Alfred Thayer Mahan, who was a famous uh, U.S. naval strategist in the late 1800s and who coined this phrase uh, to uh, promote his own uh, view by knocking other people down. But of course, we need, to, we need to think rationally about the costs and benefits and what we ought to be doing um, uh, and we, we ought to be at, uh, pressuring our government uh, to uh, restrain itself. Now, the one other thing I think that this intervention as foreign policy uh, has done is create the imperial presidency. And I'm gonna discuss that because that segues into my other work on the presidents. Um, the problem that we have is that the president is now more powerful than the, than the founders ever wanted him to be in the, in the executive branch uh, along with him. Uh, and the real problem that we have here is that war has distorted and contributed to this over time. Um, now, the checks and balances is very important um, for our republic because governments, I think, behave much the same whether they're in America, Germany, Russia. It's just that our system has, uh, is supposed to have checks and balances built in so that we have countervailing pressures of um, Congress, the Supreme Court, the state governments, um, the, that sort of thing, to uh, uh, dilute the power of the, of the federal government. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, libertarians are often rail against federal power, but I think, and that's very appropriate, but I think we ought to be more specific. What we really have a problem with here is executive power. True, Congress doesn't do the right thing. They pass bad laws, they pass pork. We all make fun of politicians, but the real problem is with the executive branch. It's exponential growth, and uh, it's really, as I say, usurped all the other branches of government. Uh, I think we're slowly headed down the road of the Roman Empire where, where power passed from the assembly to the senate to the dictator to the emperor. <laughs> and it did so largely because the Roman Empire became militarized. And all these generals with their armies came home, they had civil wars, they, uh, the liberty uh, no longer, or was eroded. And of course, the same problem is happening here, only very slowly. And I think that's very insidious because as you, uh, you know, if you're in the bathtub and you, turn, you keep turning the water up, uh, you don't, feel it as it goes up, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're scalded. And I think it's the same, it's the same problem. Now, as I mentioned, war is a major problem with this, <coughs> and has caused this, uh, this expansion of executive power. Uh, the first three presidents, uh, Washington, Adams, and Johnson, or excuse me, Jefferson, not Johnson, um, they actually made the presidency more, uh, more powerful than the founders had intended. Uh, in the Constitution, uh, if you look at the Constitution, Article One is the Congress, not the, pres not the executive branch, and the Congress has all these enumerated powers, and the President uh, has very few enumerated powers. Well, of course, the founders, uh, their conception was that the federal government wouldn't do all that much unless it was specifically mentioned. Well, of course, over time, we got, a, we got around to that, uh, we got, a, got away from that, and now we're having a commander in chief who is um, saying, well, we've got all these uh, inherent powers in, as, as, uh, my, in my role as commander in chief. And therefore, uh, it's not really written in the Constitution, but it doesn't really say I can't do it. So, uh, so they flipped the, the, um, the decision rule saying that if it's, if it's not there, I can do it, rather than uh, it has to be there or I can't do it. Um, 